I do want to talk about Sarah. And when you look at old people in the Old Testament, uh, people do one of two things. They either point them out as heroes or point them out as kind of bad. And I'm going to do both uh, because I think the Bible does both. Uh, I remember years ago when I was new in the church and I thought, man, this is heaven on earth and there's nothing wrong here and nobody ever has a bad attitude. And then on occasion, I would see people with really bad attitudes and it really startled me and worried me. And I was like, oh no, what, what, what's going on here? And then I realized the more you read the Bible, I think you see a little bit more of that. All right, so what I want to do with Sarah this morning and then tonight is two angles on Sarah, because I think both angles are there. Both voices in Scripture are there. On the one hand, she's not a hero. All right, on the one hand, when you, I think when you look at the Old Testament story, she's not the one we're supposed to imitate, nor is Abraham, for that matter, or many others. But then when you get to the New Testament, you get a different angle, and they say, hey, she is your mother. And there are some things that, uh, that you are to imitate in Sarah. And again, I think, this is, I think this is a Bible principle. And let me just illustrate the Bible principle with something that Paul does in all of his books, but particularly in the book of uh, 1 Corinthians. If you know 1 Corinthians, it's the most messed up church in the New Testament, right? It's full of all kinds of problems. It's got a weird incestuous thing going on. It's got partying at church. It's just a total mess. And Paul opens the letter and addresses them as what? Everybody knows. Saints. All right? If you grew up in, a, in a, the Catholic church, you know, saints are heroes spiritually. But the Corinthians, they ain't heroes spiritually, but Paul calls them saints. Does that make sense? He calls them saints. And I think we're too used to that word. That word means something like something that belongs in the temple. Something that belongs for sacred use in the temple. And he calls this church that's a total mess, uh, saints. And so I think there's two things going on. I think there's looking at where they are and how they're living and where their hearts are. And there's looking at where God wants to bring them. And you have to do both at the same time. Does that make sense? As Christians, we are called to be able to do both at the same time. See what's really there. See the mess that's really there. And not despair, not get discouraged, but know that God is bringing about something different. So this morning, I want to look at Sarah from angle one, which is the way I've put it as a pagan woman that doesn't really know the ways of God. And she's learning the ways of God. And then this evening, I'll look at her from, uh, I'll look at her from the New Testament perspective of uh, what she's learned. Um, so can y'all do that or keep that in mind? Those are the two, those are the two things going on is looking in two directions. And again, when Paul calls them saints, I believe he's almost, uh, he's prophesying over them. He's speaking what he knows God is doing, but he has to give himself to the patient work of calling them to that. So we'll start, um, we'll start back in the Old Testament and I'm not going to More than anything, I would encourage you to read the whole story of Sarah and Abraham that starts in Genesis 11 and goes through Genesis 23, 24. Um, I may cite a chapter, but I'm going to cite episodes and less particular scriptures when it comes to this. So first, let me remind everybody of this. Um, In Genesis chapters 2 through 11, we have the story of what sin does to culture. And it culminates in Genesis chapter 11 with the Tower of Babel. And at the Tower of Babel, mankind all got together apart from God and said, let's build a tower to heaven to make a name for ourselves, okay? They wanted fame. Uh, Not everybody wants fame, but they want a name. They want to know who they are. They want to prove who they are. They want to feel good about who they are. They want a name. Does that make sense? And so the Babylonians or the dwellers of Babel are trying to make a name for themselves. And then in the midst of all that, God calls Abraham and Sarah, and he calls them out of a city very much like Babel. And there's many promises that God gives to Abraham, but one in particular I want to highlight. He says, I want to give you a name. All right, he says, listen, you follow me. I'm going to bless you. I'm going to make you a blessing to all nations. Those that curse you, I'll curse. Those that bless you, I'll bless. I want to make a name for you. All right? God says, listen, the, Babylon, the dwellers of Babylon, they were seeking for a name apart from me, for fame, for an identity apart from me. Abraham, I'm going to give you a name, but it's going to be the name I give. 
Uh, maybe I think a good way to describe this is they want fame, and God says, I'm going to make you famous, but famous with me. I'm going to make you valuable and important, but valuable and important in my eyes. Uh, and that's the story of overall of, of um, Abraham and his wife Sarah, that he is calling them to his purposes to fix what's wrong with the world, and he is going to make a name for them. So let me emphasize this. Sarah and Abraham, I do not believe, were picked. I don't believe they were picked because they were so great. Let's start there. They were not picked because they were so great. They were not picked because they were so pious. Uh, They were not picked because they were heroes. There's lots of stories that some people tell that Abraham was this heroic worshiper of God before, but most people probably, they agree that he was probably a moon worshiper like everybody else in Ur. Uh, And so when you read the story of Abraham and Sarah, you've got to figure out who the hero is. The hero is not Abraham. The hero is not Sarah. So who's the hero? God's the hero. All right. And what we have there in the story of Sarah's life is the story not of Sarah's heroic faith as much as what she is learning about God and the ways of God and the character of God. So when you read through Genesis, you have to read, especially in her life, you have to read what is Sarah learning about God. And just a quick reminder of um, of why I say they're not heroes. Have you ever thought about putting any of the episodes of their lives in today's terms? Let's just do the Hagar thing. Domestic servant in your house, the wife says, well, you need to sleep with my husband and have a kid with him. There'd be all kinds of crimes involved there, I think. Okay? That's not exemplary. And I don't think we're supposed to understand it as exemplary. We're not imitating Sarah on this view. We're looking to see what Sarah is learning about God. All right? And that's that's what I want to focus on this morning is, what is she learning about God uh, through the story of her life um, with Abraham and their call together? Um, Well, the first thing, and I've already mentioned it, is that Sarah learns that God wants her to be a part of what he's doing to fix the world. Uh, And you have to remember how preposterous that probably seemed. They were living in the L.A. of the ancient world or the New York of the ancient world, where the action was at, where it was very important, and God called them to be nomads. Almost everything about their life probably from that point on was disappointing on certain terms. Promised Land was disappointing. Her husband was disappointing. Um... (laughs) Lots of things were disappointing. Um, But she is called to be a part of what God is doing to fix what's wrong with the world. And that's that's just really, it's either crazy or arrogant or it's really the word of God. That he really wanted to take her life and make it matter eternally. And we're going to get to that this evening. So the first thing is she just learns that God wants to use her to fix what's wrong with the world. And it's not because of her. It's because that's the kind of God he is that he invites people into what he's doing to fix what's wrong with the world, especially when they're not qualified. Um, I I don't know. I was going to tell you how many things she learns, but I may or may not say them all, so I'm just going to go along. All right, so the next one. The next one that she learns is that her husband is not her knight in shining armor. Well, how does she learn that? Let's just do Egypt really quick. Um, there's a couple of things to mention about Egypt, by the way. They get to the promised land, and the promised land is occupied, and it's in famine. So it doesn't look that promising. And he has sheep, and he's got to take care of his animals. And so they go to Egypt. The Bible doesn't say God told him to go to Egypt. We don't really know what God thought of it. Maybe it was a bad idea. I'm going to suggest probably it wasn't a good idea. Usually going to Egypt is a bad idea in the Bible. <laughs> but they go to Egypt... And on approaching Egypt, he says, "Hun, you're just so great. Listen, when we get there, they're going to want to take you, and so just tell them you're my brother so they don't kill me, okay? And that's what he tells her to do. And I am not going to defend what he says. All right? I think probably the Bible wants us to think it's indefensible. So she's taken into Pharaoh's harem. And guess what her husband does about it? Nothing. Okay, ladies, he's not, he is a hero of the faith, but he is not her knight in shining armor. Okay, who really cares about the situation and resolves it? God. Okay, Pharaoh's household is cursed, by the way, a preview of things to come, right, in later years. 
Pharaoh's house is cursed. No, nobody's having babies. None of Pharaoh's wives or concubines and none of the animals. And he finally realizes, or maybe his helpers help him realize, you've got a married woman in your harem. And so God rescues her. So she learns not to look for salvation or deliverance from her husband. But she learns to see that God wants to rescue her. And by the way, I hate to say this, but Abraham profits from this situation, right? I mean, he gets rich from it. I don't know what lesson he learned, but he gets rich from it. And so I just want you to put yourself in Sarah's shoes and get a feel for what uh, she may be learning from this. But again, I think she's learning, well, hmm, Uh, my husband is not necessarily my source of deliverance. Uh, the third thing I, mention, I want to mention, turnabout's fair play. Uh, the third thing that she learns is that God doesn't want to do things the way Egypt does. So while they're in Egypt, the Bible says that they pick up all kinds of stuff, camel, gold, silver, slaves. And so they've picked up uh, a, an Egyptian slave named Hagar. And um, Sarah, you know, she, she can't have a kid. Uh, The Bible says in several places in Genesis that God closed her womb. I want to refer back to to the earlier parts of Genesis when when Eve has Cain. I think it's when she has Cain. She she says, I got a man, right? I I had a child. And she says with the help of the Lord. But I think we're supposed to hear in that a little bit of a brag. She's kind of proud of her fertility. Like, look at what I've done. Um, And so anyway... You know, here's Sarah. She can't have a child. Uh, It's funny how things have reversed, but in that world, fertility was social capital, right? In that world, being able to have children and lots of them was power, and Sarah had none of it. So she thought, well, maybe I can build a house from my, my slave, my handmaid. And so she goes to her husband and says, you know, Abraham, uh, consider this. And again, turnabout's fair play. He went to Egypt and played on Egypt's terms, thinking maybe, hey, if I make, a, if I make a, an alliance with Pharaoh, that's how God will fulfill the purposes he said he's going to carry about. And she thinks, well, it's perfectly conventional. Everybody does this. Everybody has kids through their handmaids, so let's try that out. Does that make sense? The point I want to make is this. In that world, it was perfectly normal to do what she was doing. Mm-hmm. It was perfectly normal to try to raise up descendants, raise up heirs from slaves or others. Here's the point. It was perfectly natural. It made total sense, and it's not God's way. And she had to learn the consequences of that, and we are still living with the consequences of that, right? We are still living, and by the way, God lets us deal with the consequences even when he forgives us, right? So at any rate... She learns that that's not God's way of going about what he wants to go about. And I said, turnabout's fair play. He uses Egypt on her, and now she uses Egypt on him, and it's a headache from then on out, right? Almost immediately, after Hagar has a child, she takes pride in her fertility, and she looks with scorn on Sarah, her mistress. Um, And who does Sarah blame? (laughs) She blames Abraham, all right, which it was her idea. I'm going to come back to this in a minute. The Bible says there that he listened to the voice of his wife. He listened to Sarah's voice. Uh, That should remind you of a little bit earlier when God tells Adam, hey, because you listened to Eve and you have done this, and he mentions the judgment that comes from that. But again, let me reiterate this. When Paul addresses the Corinthians, he has to unlearn them of what is perfectly reasonable in the culture around them. Uh, half well the whole book of Corinthians is about guys you guys have bought into the culture around you and I am trying to unlearn you of that culture because it is not God's way and I caught the tail end of what Billy was sharing this morning and let me just say it is so subtle the way culture creeps in on us and the way the ways this world does things creep in on us and I just want to tell you that God is about stripping us of those ways, and sometimes allowing us not to have social capital, right? Not to have, in their world it was fertility, in our world it's various other things. God 
closed her womb to teach her his ways. Amen? Fourth one. Uh, She learns, well, um, I just mentioned it. She learns about barrenness and what it means. She had a long discipleship. She didn't have social capital. She didn't have the kind of power other people did. She didn't even have what Eve had. And notice all throughout the Bible how much this thing, this thing comes up. Remember uh, Eli and his two wives, uh, Hannah and Penina? Anna and Penina? The one has lots of kids, the other doesn't. And the one that has lots of kids rubs it in the face of the other one who doesn't. All right? God allows her to have this long time of infertility. This long discipleship in not being able to bring forth the very thing God said he wanted her to bring forth. So she could learn how to bring forth fruit the way God wants it to come forward. And she had to go through a lot of dead ends. Uh, She had to go through a lot of ways that didn't work. By the way, if I could go back and and just go back to the Hagar incident again, it's a pretty big incident. Um, The problem there wasn't so much a sexual sin as a planning and a plotting and a thinking through according to a whole different standard way of doing things. Right goal, wrong means. Does that make sense? Um, That's the scandal of it uh, more more than anything else. And God constantly is having to narrow Abraham and Sarah and say, no, not gonna do it through the concubine. No, it's not gonna be Ishmael. No, it's gonna be Sarah. That's why I rescued her from Egypt. Uh, it's, got, it's not just you, Abraham. It's you and your wife together. All right. Um, so she had to learn this lesson of barrenness. Um, and I think Abraham had to learn it with her. Um, the fifth one that I want to mention. She learns that God wants to do more for her than she can absolutely imagine. Let me, here I do want to turn to um, Genesis chapter 18. And this is, uh, I love this scene where God comes and visits Abraham and they have this conversation that she overhears at the door. I love everything about this scene. It's just funny. Um, so let's read just a little bit of it. Um, let's see. Well, so these, these three men show up, and Abraham feeds them, and he goes and he calls the wife, so she knows there are guests there, and she made the bread, and he made the animals. Um, verse 6 of chapter 18, And Abraham went quickly into the tent to Sarah and said, Quick, three sails of fine flour, knead it and make cakes. And Abraham ran to the herd and took a calf, tender and good, and gave it to the young men who prepared it quickly. Then he took curds of milk and the calf that he had prepared and set it before them, and he stood by them under the tree while they ate. Verse 9, They said to him, Where is Sarah your wife? And he said, She is in the tent. The Lord said, I will surely return to you about this time next year, and Sarah, your wife, shall have a son. And Sarah was listening at the tent tent door behind him. Now Abraham and Sarah were old, advanced in years, if we didn't know that by now. The way of women had ceased to be with Sarah. So Sarah laughed to herself, saying, after I am worn out and my Lord is old, shall I have pleasure? The Lord said to Abraham, why did Sarah laugh and say, shall I indeed bear a child now that I am old? You notice what uh, God does? He's kind of, uh, he doesn't quote Sarah directly. Did you notice that? He, he kind of softens it because she's, she's, what she says is a little harsh. Uh, the Lord said to Abraham, why did Sarah laugh and say, shall I indeed bear a child now that I am old? That's not exactly what she said. Is anything too hard for the Lord? At the appointed time, I will return to you about this time next year, and Sarah shall have a son. But Sarah denied it, saying, I did not laugh, for she was afraid. He said, no, but you did laugh. (laughs) Now, I don't know who said no, but you did laugh. It doesn't say. I always thought it was Abraham, but maybe it was God. (laughs) No, no, you laughed. I heard it. I saw it. So I love everything about this scene, because this is just like life at home. Well, it's very realistic, right? I mean, this is a domestic scene. She says something you can imagine a lot of women saying. She denies it. She's afraid. All kinds of things going on. Um, But she laughs, and God says, listen, I'm going to take your laugh, which is a cynical laugh, which is you don't really believe it. It's too good to be true. 
And I'm going to turn that into the very point. Uh, I'm going to take the thing that, that you didn't believe that was beyond your expectation, that was too good to be true, and when people hear you tell this story, they're just going to laugh. And it's going to be so much the point that you're going to name your kid hilarious. <laughs> because it's a testimony of you've got to be kidding me. You had a kid at that age? There's, it's impossible. Um, so I love that scene. And I love that, that, God is, that God is teaching her that well past her point of hope, well past her point of thinking that God could do what he said. She's settling maybe. Uh, God says, no, I'm going to do what I've said I'm going to do, uh, and it's going to be hilarious. Um, the next one, she learns that God has never really done working with her. You know, the story that's narrated in Genesis of their lives covers almost 100 years, um, and Abraham learns this story too. They're well advanced in years when God does some of the most important stuff that he does in their lives. Uh, and so they learn that God is, like Paul said, look, I'm not done, I'm not finished. And uh, we should never expect ourselves to plateau in terms of what God wants to do in us and the deeper thing that God wants to do in us. Um, this is the seventh one by my counting, is that right? Okay. And I'm, I'm almost done, actually. She learns that sometimes her husband should listen to her and sometimes not. I like this one. Because I mentioned that uh, God says, because you listen to your wife, uh, and he brings this judgment. But later on, after Hagar's, or after Isaac is born, God visits her and Isaac is born, she sees Ishmael laughing at Isaac, and she realizes this is trouble, and she says, Abraham, you've got to get rid of the slave woman. And this is another scene that it's kind of like, whoa, yeah, that's harsh, but Abraham's upset about it, right? He, he, he loves Ishmael. But God says, do whatever Sarah tells you. Do what, she, do what she tells you. She is right. Because the child of promise is the one that's going to inherit, not the child with the slave woman. And so here's the point I want to make here, is that when she's got her head on right, she should be listened to. But when she doesn't have her head on right, she shouldn't be listened to. Does that make sense? When God, said that to, when God said that to Adam, I don't think the point was, don't ever listen to your wife. She, he listened to his wife when she was asking him to do something he knew he was not supposed to do. Does that make sense? So this is not, it's not just a, a total judgment on wives here. It's when she has her head on straight, there are times you need to hear what she is saying. And Abraham learned he had, that he needed to do that in this case. And it was something, by the way, he didn't want to do. Uh, it was something that, um, but it was something that Sarah was right about. God wanted him uh, to do that. And so he sends uh, Ishmael away. And I, I, we should add that God blesses Ishmael, right? Um, that, that God says, listen, because he's your descendant, I'm going to bless him. But he's not the one I'm bringing my purposes in the earth through. The last one that I'll mention um, this one may be a stretch, but I think she learns after this long course in her life. By the way, if we were just to narrate these events, I haven't said that, you know, you, she gets captive to the harem of Pharaoh, and then they come back, and then uh, later God changes Abraham's name and her name. Uh, and then God gives that word there at the tent. And it's after that that what happens again? Does anybody remember? It's after that, after the name change, after God says, Abraham, you're gonna, or Abram, you're going to be Abraham, and Sarai, you're going to be Sarah. It's after that that she is in the harem of Abimelech. It's round two of the same thing. All right, Abraham does the same thing again. Uh, so she's still learning. <laughs> that Abraham is not necessarily uh, her knight in shining armor. But at any rate, after she has Isaac, after God visits her, we, we hear nothing else from Sarah. We are told nothing about her knowledge of or what she thinks about what Abraham is going off to do on Mount Moriah to sacrifice Isaac. Uh, I think if this had been a Sarah of 25 years prior, we'd have heard a lot more. Uh, but 
she learns to be quiet and trusting in the face of what God is doing. Uh, and then after that, and this is to me the beautiful, the beautiful end of Sarah's life. Um, she's the first person in the Bible to be mourned for. When she dies, it says that Abraham goes into the tent and wept over her. Uh, he had, I believe, probably gone from less than a lot of respect for Sarah to recognizing what God had done in Sarah uh, and really honoring that. Uh, and so uh, I think it's a beautiful end to her life. Um, and then that whole episode where Abraham is trying to, to find a tomb for her. So let me just ask a couple questions here at the end. Um, and these are the big ones. The question in your life, sometimes we try to measure up and sometimes we try to conform. You know, a lot of people, a lot of people hear about the Proverbs 31 woman. They're like, okay, I got to measure up to the Proverbs 31 woman. I think the Proverbs 31 woman knows God. And she is the Proverbs 31 woman because she has learned things about God. And I think the Proverbs 31 woman, you, we could argue, probably started out an awful lot like Sarah. So the question is not so much, are you the Proverbs 31 woman, as much as, what have you learned about God? What have you learned about his forgiveness? What have you learned about his willingness to use you? What have you learned about the ways that he allows things in your life that humble you and cause you to trust in him? What have you learned uh, what is your testimony about God? I think, again, I often talk about this in the Old Testament survey. If we talk to uh, Abraham in his later years, what would he tell us about God? And he would tell us stories about things God did in his life. What would you tell about God? It should be stories about what you have learned from him, and they don't all have to make you look good. That makes sense? In fact, they can make you look bad. That's okay. Because it's a testimony about what God has done. And I guess I should just say here how important testimony is. Testimony is not just how you became a Christian. Testimony is telling all the things that God has done in your life. And as you, as you age, your testimony should get longer. And I would encourage you to constantly go back to it and just keep a brief record of the things that God has done so that you can share them. Um, I, I'll just mention this in my home group here recently. We went through every single person sharing their testimony over the course of about two and a half months. And it was one of, it's been the best home group I've ever been in. Not, sorry, my other home group. Uh, it's been very good. It, hadn't it been people in that home group? It's been very powerful. Um, so at any rate, what have you learned about God? And then secondly, the other question I want to ask, um, what, is un, what is God unlearning you from? And again, I, I, I know Billy mentioned this this morning. I think this is probably a very important theme. There are ways that we think because of the air that we breathe. There are ways that we operate that are perfectly reasonable. And God wants to come and say, that's not my way. And I guess the important thing to stress is just like Billy said, it's not the obvious thing. Sometimes it's very subtle things in Christian books. Christian books and Christian internet sites. Does that make sense? The ways that God is trying to teach us are the ways of the cross. And those are often foolishness to the world. Uh, they are often disdained and they are not, uh, they are not appealing. Uh, they're not appealing to us naturally. So I do want to close by reading out of 1 Corinthians, which says nothing about Sarah, but I think it does speak of Sarah. It doesn't mention her name, but I think it's, it's referring to Abraham and Sarah, who were not promising according to the world's ways. But does that make sense? And here's my confidence. Sometimes we need one another to point out, hey, Chad, that is a totally worldly way of thinking. And I know it totally makes sense to you. I know it's your habit and your reflex, but that's not God's way of doing things at all. That's not God's way of thinking about yourself or thinking about... It's not. Sometimes we need one another, but my confidence is that God has given us his Holy Spirit to be our constant teacher and to, through those episodes of life where we don't look so great, he comes and he says, this is not my way. And he gives us the opportunity to say, all right, I want to rest in your way.
I want to trust your way of doing things. Does that make sense? All right, so I want to read here out of 1 Corinthians, um, <clears throat> where he talks about, um, he's talking to the Corinthians as people who've been captured by Egypt. They've been captured by different ways of doing things. I think this is a fitting end. For consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the, the wise. God chose Sarah to shame Hagar. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose Abraham and Sarah, not somebody out of Egypt. God shows what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. I heard an expression I've never heard before. Hagar being proud of her fertility. Have you ever heard this expression? It's like being born on third base and thinking you hit a triple. I don't, I'm not much for sports analogies, but isn't that good? And have you ever noticed how much people invest their identity in things like that? They were born with something or they had something. Shannon's explaining a triple to my daughter, Audrey. I, th I thought it was great. We're born with all kinds of things and then we go on to take credit for them somehow and get our identity in them. Where God wants us to get our identity in the ways we have cooperated with him, the ways we have trusted him, uh, the things that he has done in us to bring forth the fruit that he wants. And because of him, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption, so that as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. So again... Sarah, if you read Genesis, Sarah should help us put our guard down and realize, here's our mother in the faith, and we're going to talk about ways in which she's our mother in the faith, but she had to learn just like everybody else, and she had to unlearn just like everybody else, uh, and her testimony is of the character of God, and her testimony is of God doing something only he could so that she couldn't boast in it, and that's where God's wanting to get us, that he does unbelievable, hilarious things through us, and we never give a single thought to us in it, but simply to what he's done through us. Amen? All right. Um, Shannon, Brenda, any thoughts or questions before we, before we wrap? Yeah. That was 1 Corinthians chapter 1. I, let me check. I think it's, there you go, 26 to 31. Any other thoughts, questions, comments? That is a great question. Did, did everybody hear that? So in the ancient world, one of the biggest things a woman could boast in was fertility. Okay, And I know that's kind of switched, right? Now maybe a career is more important than fertility, right? Um, but that was something women boasted in. The question is, what are other things in our day that women can boast and take identity in? And you know what? I'm going to add that as a question for you all to discuss. No, I mean, I have some thoughts, but I think that would be a good thing to talk around mm -hmm. what are things and part of the reason is because i think the th the examples have multiplied mm -hmm. right i mean people take pride in ridiculous things mm -hmm. just all over the map um but i would like to hear from y'all maybe some things that women are tempted to boast in take pride in, get their identity and make a name for themselves in um so that is a great question shannon Yeah, did everybody hear that? So there are probably two sets of things. There's clearly things in the world that women might boast of and get their identity in. But then in the church, there can be all kinds of things women could boast in and get their identity in, right? Um, and I think, you know, 1 Corinthians 13, when Paul says, you can give all your money to the poor and feel really good about yourself. But if you don't have love, you're nothing, right? So I think that 
I think the Bible is full of examples of that. Ananias and Sapphira. Wow, look at how look at how Barnabas got so much respect for giving that money. Let's do that. And we'll just keep back some. Right? That's a great example of something like that. Um, yeah. So that's a great question. Thank you. I think that's a that's a perfect way to leave it. All right. I'll pray. Shannon, Brenda, back to you. Yeah. Father, uh, again, we thank you that you are so patient. Lord, you knew who you were dealing with when you called Abraham and Sarah. Lord, you knew all the ways they were steeped in the culture around them. And you knew it was going to take time and that you were going to have to teach them all kinds of lessons and that all kinds of ugly stuff was going to come to the surface in that process. So, Lord, I want to thank you that there we learn of you that you are persistent, that you are patient, that you are undeterred. And, Lord, that you can change character at the roots. Uh, so, Lord, I thank you for your call on the women in this room. Uh, Father, I thank you that you know they are Sarah's, that you are turning into Sarah. Uh, Lord, I thank you that you know all the ways that are inside them that you're trying to get out. And that, Father, because you have begun that work, you're going to see it through to completion. And, Lord, I pray that you would just give them uh, the flexibility of faith to cooperate with you when you are doing that work inside of them. Uh, and I thank you that we have Sarah as an example of that. I bless you for that, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen.